Good evening. Thank you for coming out on this cold evening tonight to the Joint Town Council School Board Public Forum on Budgets. I'm Ann Swift Kayata. I'm the finance chair of the Town Council. Kathy Ray, the finance chair of the school board, and I are jointly chairing this meeting. Due to the national recession and falling municipal and school revenues, our town is facing significant financial challenges in the coming year. That's fiscal year 2010. The council and school board will have to make difficult decisions in balancing citizens' needs for services and their ability to pay higher property taxes. For this reason, councillors and school board members are looking for direction from Cape Elizabeth's citizens. We are particularly interested in hearing your suggestions in three areas, indicated over there on that flip chart page. Please be as specific as possible with your input. The three areas are your ideas for increasing town and school revenues through fees or in other ways, anything you can think of. Secondly, what services or programs you would prefer to be cut or eliminated if we do have to shrink spending. And third, your thoughts on what the proper, proper level of property taxes should be. In other words, how much higher or lower you want taxes to be. Your priorities and needs will help drive both boards' budgeting processes this year. Our job will be to balance all priorities and important competing needs, including the desire of some citizens to keep property taxes as low as possible. We have no fiscal year 10 budgets to show you at this point because the process is just beginning. You may find this frustrating, but most of the information the boards have now is based on assumptions. Over the next weeks and months, our information will become more concrete and we will be able to start moving toward more definite budget decisions. The budget schedule for the council is as follows, and Kathy's going to address the school board's process and schedule in a minute. First, municipal department heads will submit their departmental budgets to the town council by February 13th. The manager, the town manager, will submit his recommended budget to the council by March 6th. The school board will deliver their budget to the council by March 19th. From March 19th to April 1st, the town council's finance committee will review all budgets. A formal public hearing on all budgets will take place on April 13th. On April 30th, the town council will adopt final budgets for the municipality, our share of the county budget, and community services. It will also vote on a total school budget number, dollar number, to send to the citizens for public referendum. A citizen vote on the school budget will be held on May 12th. If approved, that will be the end of the process for this year. If not approved, the school board and town council will set another school budget total number, and citizens will vote again until a final school budget is approved. I must emphasize that neither the council nor the school board has received a manager's or superintendent's recommended budget yet. We are at the beginning of the process and no numbers are final yet. That is why we're here tonight, to get your input at the beginning, not the end of the process, so we can build budgets that reflect citizen priorities. The two boards will be meeting a week from tonight in a joint workshop at Cape High School to work further on budget issues. We remain committed to work together for the best interests of our community. And now I'll turn it to Kathy Ray. Thank you. Um, I'm going to just cover the school uh, department's <coughs> budget format as I know that sometimes there's questions that have come up in the past. The format for the schools to set a budget each year is a multi-level process. It starts with the superintendent working with his staff to create a budget that becomes the superintendent's budget. That budget is then submitted to the school board for review. The school board makes changes to the budget and then votes on a final school board budget, accepting the final budget con content and financial figures based on majority vote. 
Up until last year, that budget was then submitted to the town council and they then voted to accept or deny by majority vote. The budget that was the one that moves forward, that is the budget that moves forward to the following year. Last year, there was an additional step based on legislation where the budget that went to the voters for approval. That is the process we will have in place again this year. As far as the 2009-2010 budget for the school system is concerned, the school board by majority vote has set a 2% increase in a spending target for the superintendent to shoot for in his first attempt at putting together a budget. It is very early in the process and some assumptions made now may change as the town council and school board move forward. It's important not to assume that numbers floating out in the public are set in, so, set in stone, excuse me, because they are clearly not. It is very important that we take the time to listen to the thoughts of many and make decisions that are based on fact and not rumor. Thank you for coming this evening. And I might note that the people that are standing in the back, I know it's not popular, but there are quite a few seats in the front two rows. So if you dare to, uh, please feel free to take a seat. Okay, a few housekeeping details before we get going. This is our chance, the, the two boards' chance to listen to you and to hear what your priorities are. It is not a time for us to debate with the public or with each other or to make speeches. Other than Kathy's and my running the meeting, board members will not be addressing the public. Our role is to listen carefully to you. If you have a comment or suggestion, please come to the podium over there. It has a microphone so that all can hear. And please state your name and address. We ask that you be courteous in your remarks and that the audience please refrain from clapping and cheering or anything else like that. Such outbursts can be intimidating to people who have different viewpoints and we do not want to chill public discourse. There are a lot of people here tonight, which is a good thing. So please try to keep your remarks succinct, three minutes or so. It helps us all save time if people line up at the podium so we don't have big gaps between speakers because that chews up a lot of time. Lastly, while you're free to comment in any way on budgets, it would be most helpful if you could focus on, again, the three things over there. Ideas for revenue enhancements, specific priorities for service or program cuts, and third, your thoughts on the appropriate level of local property taxes. I thank you for your willingness to share your views with us and for your interest in our community. And with that, we're going to open it up. So whoever wants to be brave and go first, come up to the podium, please. <laughs> could be a wise policy tonight. Hi, my name is uh, Bob Tripler. I live in Trundy Road, the Cape Elizabeth Shore Acres. And I've just written a very short thing for Ramble. Okay. I think that one of the goals should be minimizing pain. Uh, by that I mean eliminating positions should be kept to a zero if possible. One way to making this possible could be to freeze the entire payroll of the whole community, both municipal and school departments at either the 2008-2009 level or the 2007-2008 level, if necessary. I'm a, I'm a retired school teacher from away. I struggle with the kind of minimal pay that the academic world afforded education educators in the quote, good old days. You wouldn't believe my first salary was $2,700 a year. I joined the union and helped fight for better working conditions and pay. However, I will say that my classroom performance neither improved nor declined in relation to the pay scale. I hope persons from the top down would be willing to tighten their belts if that's what it takes to save jobs for all. Don't be shy. Just please come up. Yes, sir, do you have a question about the process? Do you want the speakers to address the issues in the order that you've indicated? 
or is it random? It does, you can, when people come up, they can address whatever budget issues they want in any order that they want, but we are particularly interested in those specific suggestions in those three areas. I'm sorry, go ahead, please. That's fine. My name is Mary Page. I live at 39 Forest Road in the Mountain View Park area. Basically, in my neighborhood, uh, neighbor, uh, my neighborhood borders Shore Road. I'm also a teacher, and I have three children in the school system, so obviously I have a vested interest in the school system. However, my message is twofold. One, on increasing revenues. Um, I've heard it said over and over again that the surveys show how much Cape residents really value open space and how they value public access lands. And I agree, I concur, I use a lot of lands, Robson Woods, um, all, the, all the open space. However, I feel that we, th that does not preclude development, commercial development. I feel that we should have more commercial development, frankly, in Cape. I think that could bring tax dollars, tax revenue in. And I think if it's done correctly, it does not have to be this blight on the community. I think it could be an addition to the community. People, residents could bike, walk, whatever, as opposed to drive to shops. Secondly, on keeping on property tax levels, a little very brief story I want to share. Um, I sometimes jog, trot, as my son says, along the areas. And I stop in to um, open homes in the area. And because I neighbor, um, I am on the boundary of Shore Road, I frequently stop in in those open houses. And about three years ago, I stopped into one on Drew Road, which I was not aware at the time. One side of the street is South Portland, one side is Cape Elizabeth. And it was a lovely home, ocean views, beach right down the street, in my opinion, a very low price. And I was asking the real estate agent, why has this house not sold? It's been on the market some time. And she goes, well, it's location. And I'm thinking location, beach access, beautiful. It's not on a busy street. And she goes, well, this side of the street, this house is on the South Portland side. This other side is Cape Elizabeth. Oh, Cape Elizabeth. If it had been on the Cape Elizabeth side, it would have sold right away for a higher price. And when I looked puzzled, she said, it's the schools. So as you think about what cuts to make, please keep in mind that whether or not you have children in the school system, all of our property values are held high because of the value of that school system and what it means to others. Thank you. If you have a cell, I'll just repeat that. If you have a cell phone or a pager and you come too close to the microphone, apparently that happens. That turns see. it off. Uh, my name is Patrick Babcock. I live at 503 Ocean House Road in Cape Elizabeth. Um, my solution is probably not going to be the more popular one, so hopefully I'll try and get to that a little bit later in this. But initially I want to talk about um, the, uh, the fact that the police dispatch is going to be on the chopping block here. And um, I know we all live in Cape Elizabeth because we somewhat view it as our a little corner of the utopian village of America and that's why I moved out here and I've been here for eight years happily paying my taxes most of which have been going to the school system and I'm all for that because at one point my wife and I were figuring on having children here of which we are so is my pregnant wife who's now uh, looking to unleash our first child upon uh, the school system uh, so I can get back some of my taxes now uh, is upon us I think to myself, what really is my priority and where do I want my taxes to go and where would I like to see the cuts made? And I, I you know, at least speaking from my own experience, having grown up in the 70s, I recall a lawless society and I recall pretty much a lawless school system back then. And for the most part, many of my peers, even the ones who were rather studious, uh, spent a very little time interested in school and most uh, of our time interested in extracurricular activities. And during that time across America, as I said, it was a lawless society. And many of us recall what that brought upon as far as uh, drug addiction or divorce rate or what have you. Uh, you know, we really didn't look after ourselves. And living in a small community, I can't stress enough the importance of having, first of all, I personally know Greg Tinsman. Only, not only is, is he my neighbor, but it's because I've made use of that service. And I sleep well at night because of that service. I don't sleep well at night knowing that your children or soon my child, and I'm not trying to make enemies here, but it's soon my child is taking an advanced placement science course or that I can dump my trash seven days a week 
or that the pool's open, or even that we have a pool. That's great. That's our idea of utopia, and it has been for a long time. But in particular, I think our community has to somewhat wake up and smell the, the collective, I hate to use this word, but, but greed coffee. We've been living high on the horse for a long time. We've been building big houses, big extensions, and you know, driving around in our SUVs. And we're all happy about that. A nice field for the kids to play on. And our taxes have been going to that, and we're happy about that. But we are in a huge crisis right now. And I'm more than willing, and I'm, 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 I'd, I'd write a check right now for an increase in my property taxes to make sure that that dispatch uh, and that form of safety in my community, because that's how I sleep well at night. Uh, and, and that's how I'm, I'm hoping my child and my wife, when I'm out of town on business, to make the money to pay for these taxes, sleeps well at night knowing that she could call someone like Greg Tinsman at any time of the day or night, and he's going to respond because he knows where I live, what our needs are, and then a, a police cruiser shows up like that. If that's just a phone up there, we lose the utopian idea of safety and, well, public health. That's the other element of utopia. Public health is not on the chopping block tonight. But our safety is. I can't stress enough how much I'd be happily willing to forego maybe taking an extra trip to Boston every month in my SUV and putting that money towards property taxes if indeed that's what this town council and the school board chooses. Do you want to cut a little bit of the pool or a couple of the uh, AP science courses? I really don't care. I spent very little time in school myself. I've got my degree somehow. I managed to do that. I'm a private business owner right now and I can afford my property taxes. That's not my focus. My focus is the safety of my wife and my child, who I want to maintain here in Cape Elizabeth. Thank you very much. Thank you. I will be concerned with the same issue. My name is Waldeck Mainville. I live at 29 Merrimack Place, which is in a Hobstone condominium off of Mitchell Road. I've been a resident there since 1985. In the 1960s, my children attended Cottage Farm School walking home at lunchtime because there was no cafeteria. I lived in the Mountain View section since 1965 to 1985. The rescue responded to three 911 calls today. All three patients were transported to Maine Medical Center. The last call was to Pond Cove Elementary School. The distance from Town Center Station to Pond Cove School is greatly reduced if the gate at the end of Jordan Way is opened. Our local dispatcher knew this today. The driver was told that the gate was unlocked and could easily be opened. Their knowledge of local terrain, their knowledge of personnel, and their knowledge of Cape Elizabeth will be gone if our dispatchers are fired. Before you make a final decision as to whether or not to close our dispatch center, please consider the following concerns. How much will it save the town? This year, next year, five years from now, has this been studied? Who in town studied it? How do you measure money spent for town emergencies versus money spent for non-emergencies such as community and or town-sponsored programs? How is it that this item has not been brought before the citizens in a well-publicized format before tonight to allow full and informed discussion? Last Saturday, my wife and I went to the 66 units in Comstone to talk to neighbors about this. Most had no idea the town was discussing this issue. How will this change response times for fire and rescue calls? State statistics show that our present rescue response to 911 calls are among the quickest in the state, an incredible feat, considering both the rescue and wet team are completely staffed by volunteers, a fact seldom realized by town citizens. Some portable radios used by fire, rescue, and wet team members cannot be used in certain parts of the town, such as Fort Williams Park or in the Two Lights area. Radio communication is essential since volunteers can be almost anywhere in town when a 911 call is toned out by the dispatchers. Will the use of these radios be compromised if dispatch moves to Wyndham, Gray, or Portland? If there is an emergency at Murray's gravel pit, Will an out-of-town dispatcher know that it will take about two minutes for the rescue or fire to arrive at the scene? Will they know it's a right-hand turn off of Fowler Road and another right shortly thereafter? Several times this year, the rescue has been dispatched to public safety buildings. 
Citizens have gone directly to our dispatchers seeking assistance. What happens in the future if the only contact there will be a telephone? Do any of you on the town council know what a comfort the dispatchers are to rescue wet team and fire department volunteers as well as those citizens calling for aid? Many times our local dispatchers, all EMT trained, stay on the phone with the caller until rescue members arrive at the scene, often giving the rescue members additional information about the call, such as the access to the property and updating patient histories. Excuse, Finally, excuse me, if you could just start to wrap up, I'd appreciate it. I have one paragraph. <laughs> Speaking as a member of the rescue company, we are revenue source for this town because the town bills rescue patients insurance. The efficient and effective job that we do requires a team effort and our local dispatchers are an essential part of the team. We don't want to lose them. Cape Elizabeth is a very affluent town. I'm convinced the citizens want the best emergency services. I ran the rescue company today to the elementary school. I hope your child was not the person that we took to the hospital. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <coughs> Who's next? I guess I'll go. <coughs> My name is Tim Lampson, and I live on 33 Ramble Road in East Brentwood, very close to the school. And, um, I'm here to talk about a very focused part of the school that I do not want to see cut at all. And um, that would be the Achievement Center. Um, and it crossed my mind earlier today that why am I even here? Why am I even at this meeting? Because I'm a senior in high school who's already been accepted to college next year. And I'm not returning to Cape Elizabeth High School in the fall. So why should I care what even happens while I'm gone? My mother would say that I'm here by my own choice, which is true, but there's more. It is my responsibility to be here. I'm not here to look better on a college application. That part's already done. <laughs> and I do not come here representing the student body. I don't represent the student body because I can only speak for myself and my experiences. And the most valuable one from the high school is the Achievement Center. Dr. Melanson has selflessly had writing conferences with me and my essays for the past four years. She's helped me realize my potential as a writer and that would have never been unlocked any other way. In the two weeks before my SATs, she met with me each day after school, one-on-one, -on -one, to give me the individual attention that I needed in order to succeed. I didn't have the money to pay for a $600 prep class, and without the Achievement Center, I would have zero preparation for the SAT. Ms. Raspeller from the Achievement Center also um, helped me with the math section of the SAT, but she's done a lot more than just that. Ever since I was an awkward freshman, Ms. Raspeller helped me as a mentor. She gave me academic advice, tutored me through tough subjects, and even listened to my personal problems when my parents went through divorce. In the past week alone, I've used the Achievement Center's resources probably to the limit anybody could ever use them. I use them in preparing presentations for quiet study, scholarship applications, essay writing, conferences, and once again, talking to two of my favorite um, teachers. I cannot imagine any school without the Achievement Center. Every school has a library, every school has classrooms, but not every school has the Achievement Center. It's what strengthens our school, and taking it away would be a direct blow to the students. I am only here speaking as one student, but I know I'm not alone. But even if I was, shouldn't that be enough? Thank you. Thank you. If I could encourage people to line up just two or three deep, that would be helpful. Thank you. Laura Lee Shadell, One Wainwright Drive. Um, two things. One, increasing revenues. Is there an opportunity to review what we thought in the past for Fort Williams, looking about increasing revenues there? One, possibly, again, that charge to get in. Two, possibly using the fort more for bigger venues to increase revenues. And secondly, probably a slip on my part, but could you please tell me again after tonight what exactly you're going to do with all this information? I'll address that. We are, um, both boards are having a joint workshop next week and we'll be reviewing what we hear. Um, all of us will sort of put it into our own analysis of what 
we feel are the priorities. You know, we put it into the mix, and then we will be sitting down. We haven't even received the managers or the superintendent's budgets yet, so they're here too to listen. So when you say all of us, are you going to meet as individual boards or like tonight coming together? A week from now we'll be meeting as a joint group and a joint workshop. But then the school board by charter is um, their, it is their decision alone to make decisions about programs and curriculum in the schools. And so they will formulate their budget and they will forward that to us on the town council. Okay, thank you. Barbara Shankle, 32 Belfield Road. <clears throat> I'll be very brief. Um, as we all know, times are very, very difficult right now. All of us use the town services. Fewer than half of us, I think it's about a third of the town, uses the school services. We all agree that the schools are very important. However, the schools had a 5.3% increase last year. Enrollment, to my understanding, has been going down since 2002. The, um, the municipal part of the government shouldn't have to absorb the greatest percentage of the reductions. I'm urging you, if the, if the town is going to reduce by 2%, the school should reduce by 2%. We have to be fair because we all do use the municipal facilities. I don't have any answers in terms of what should be cut and how to raise money. I think there may be ways to look at utilities to see if there isn't a better way to buy oil, um, to get electricity. I don't know what they are, but I think there are probably some experts in this town who do about sharing costs and expenses so they don't, not to the detriment of the town. And I'd also like to say, which is going to be really unpopular, that there are some people in town who don't like when people don't support every single thing that the school district wants. It doesn't mean that some of us are against the schools. It just means that we'd like to be mindful of how much people are paying in their taxes at this really tough period of time. Thank you. Thank you. How are you doing? My name is Paul Fenton, and I'm the detective with the police department here in Cape Elizabeth. Uh, Twelve years ago, I started with the police department. I took an oath to protect the citizens of Cape Elizabeth and look out for their best interest and safety, and I believe I'm doing so tonight by speaking to you about the possibility of cutting dispatch. I met with Manager McGovern uh, just prior to the holidays, and he mentioned to me that he was considering uh, cutting dispatch as one of the cuts. Uh, my initial feeling was I was almost hurt that they were going to cut staffing, especially since our dispatchers of all. Uh, through them, we have over 100 years of dedication to the town, and I found it, I understand that there's tough uh, economic times ahead, but to think that we're cutting people and not things was a little bit hurtful. Um, these people, these uh, dispatchers have been dedicated, like I said, some of them for 30 plus years, coming in on holidays, nights, and to think that we're going to cut them uh, was shocking to me at first. But then I started to think of the safety issues that with it, went with it. I started to think of, this would mean that dispatch would be closed at night, and I started to think of all the times over the past 12 years, the people have come to the station at night, whether it be uh, people who were stalking victims, people who were being followed, medical emergencies. Uh, I remember one time there was a girl who was having an allergic reaction, needed an EpiPen, her throat was closing, she couldn't breathe. Uh, I started to think that the station almost is a beacon of hope for somebody, or a beacon of safety where you can go and, and expect to have safety. And to think that they could show up and there would be no one there, but there would be a phone connected to someone 25 miles away, sounded like something more of a horror movie. Uh, I then started to, uh, I decided to contact some local agencies who have gone to, uh, uh, to dispatch that has been consolidated. Uh, and initially, immediately I, I saw the differences. I was uh, transferred numerous times, hung up on, sent back and forth, unable to be told when officers were working, when they were in. Uh, I was connected to the town hall, told that it was closed, took numerous phone calls. And I invite any of you to, uh, if you just want to compare, call on a Sunday night and ask for uh, Detective Fenton and see what type of response you get from our dispatchers. Then call a county dispatch and ask for a GORM officer and see how many answers you get. They're unable to give you any information. I'll take that same thing if there's a school emergency like a bombing or something of that sort and try to think of how you would feel at that point if you're trying to get through and find out pertinent information about your child but yet you're put on hold because a dispatcher is now in charge of 16 communities instead of one. 
who has no real first-hand knowledge of the community like we have here. I think more so in the times of emergency, you want people who know what they're talking about and know the areas. When I spoke with officers from other departments, they described to me uh, being sent to the wrong area, being sent to the wrong calls, no accountability for the dispatches because they don't work for the town. They work for somebody else. So now when they complain about how they were dispatched to the wrong area, they never know if their issues were addressed because they tell their boss, but the dispatchers have a different boss, so they never know if things will be corrected. I've heard of officers who said they went to a bank robbery, for example, and never found out there were shots fired until they got home to watch the news that night because the information was never relayed because it had to go through too many dispatchers. Um, numerous things I wanted to say tonight, but I'm trying to keep it short because I know there's a lot of people who want to speak. Um, overall, I, I just think there's a real, a true safety issue, and I truly believe there will be a safety issue if, if we regionalize dispatch. Um, and once again, I ask that we decide to find some things to cut, not people to cut. Thank you. Thank you, Detective. Hi, I'm Eric Olson, uh, 31 Kildeer, um, which is off of Mitchell Road. Um, I hear people talking tonight, and they, everybody has some pet project that they want to save. Um, we're not really offering any solutions to keeping these projects, to keeping the people, to uh, keeping jobs and, and whatnot. Some things uh, that I can see just uh, from a periphery, um, things like lowering the temperature of the schools by a degree or two. Um, uh, Things like we've got we've got a library, and uh, there's one that I drive by every day in South Portland. Every day, that library I drive right by that library. There's no there's no need to, to have a library here and five miles away have the same have the same ability to check out books and to um, to get periodicals and do research. Um, these are just a couple of things that I see just purely on the periphery. I think if we were to really examine our budget in more detail that we could find ways of everybody keeping their jobs, not increasing taxes, and making our budget. Thank you, sir. Good evening. My name is Brian Dennison. I live at 11... 69 Sawyer Road. I have lived in Cape Elizabeth my entire life. In fact, I am now raising my two sons in the same house. Although I am here as a resident of the town, I have also been on the fire department for 35 years, and my wife is an EMT for the rescue. We are here tonight to ask that the dispatch center stay in Cape Elizabeth. We have been given a number of $86,000, the projected savings for the first year. What about the second, third, fourth, and fifth year? Once we make the move, we will have no control on the cost, and there's no going back and I am sure the cost will increase. Cumberland County dispatchers are currently serving 18 towns. They have five to six dispatchers on duty depending on the time of day. One of the dispatchers is used solely for the Sheriff's Department. Again, we have one dispatcher solely for the town of Cape Elizabeth. The combined years of service for the current dispatchers are over 100 years. They know the roads, infrastructure, the areas of town known only by the residents, such as the Strip, Library Hill, Rands Hill, and all the different areas of Fort Williams, Crescent Beach, Grand Island, et cetera, I can go on. There was a rescue at Fort Williams at 4 a.m. It was a foggy night, and the caller did not know where he was within the park. The dispatcher, knowing Fort Williams, was able to direct emergency personnel and equipment. I have been on numerous rescue calls at the dispatch center. Someone has driven in with a medical emergency. Imagine their surprise when the sign says, closed, please pick up the phone. I know the expenses need to be cut in order to keep real estate taxes down which also means services will be reduced. Some areas I would like the counselors and town manager to review would be fitness center. After last year's attempts to sell a fitness center failed due to it not being profitable, it was determined to keep it open. Why are we putting thousands of dollars in a black hole? Community services. Although this is a valuable service to the residents, it needs to be more self-sufficient. We should not be supplementing this service. Reduced hours at the library and town halls. Anybody looked at that? The rescue is a revenue for producer. Use a percentage to help offset the cost of the dispatchers. The dispatcher is the first link in the call. They use their emergency medical dispatch experience to keep 
the caller on the phone until EMT is on the scene. I realize that the union is involved with the dispatcher's contract. Has the town manager discussed with them renegotiating their contract? In closing, my brother has been a public safety dispatcher for 30 years. He currently works at one of the busiest centers. They answer all the 911 cell phone calls for Southern Maine, dispatch state police, and 15 York County towns for fire and rescue. I asked him recently what happens when multiple agencies need dispatch services. He answered that this is a cluster and some calls get put on hold. Is it really worth the savings of $20 per tax bill? <coughs> Thank you. Good evening, folks. I'm Sam Sherry. I live on Campion Road. Um, unlike so many of the previous speakers, I've only lived in town since 1993. I'm here to talk briefly about the school budget and to draw on my experience living in other towns. I have family in a town in Connecticut. There are 146 municipalities in Connecticut and that particular town has schools that are ranked 143rd out of the 146 municipalities. One of the principal characteristics of that town is that the school budget goes to vote four and five and six times over and over again. What I have to say about the budget is that I'm extremely excited to see the school board and to see the town council sitting here tonight working together. I don't have any pet project or pet peeve. I would simply ask that you all work together to formulate a budget which has the strongest chance of passing the first time. It might mean that an increase is less or a cut is more harsh than some might wish, but it's the surest way to keep the people who make our schools as strong as, uh, as strong as they are. Thank you all for the work you do. Thank you. Hi there. Um, I'm Ippie Altsnauer, and I live at 25 Kildeer Road. And I'd like to thank the council um, and the school board for providing an arena for the community to voice our concerns and um, ask some questions. Um, a couple of specific questions that I have are, while you all are going through this laborious process, are you going to make available to the public specific lines that are currently of challenge in both the municipal and school budgets? I'm not sure I understood your question. The, the budgets, the, the detail in the budgets. Are those going to be made public? Are they available for the town to review? Is it something that we are able to weigh in on as you guys are going through the process? All budget meetings, all budget workshops are open to the public. That doesn't mean that the public gets to come and weigh in their work sessions, but um, they are open to the public. And at least for the council, we put all the um, budget materials online. So they're available on the website. I just, I'm, I was looking at the budget that is currently on the town website and it's very vague. So it just wasn't clear, and I'm wondering if that detail is lives someplace where we just need to. Are you talking navigate. about the school or the town budget now? Both. The, the school budget that's on the website is probably the budget for 2008-2009. Um, so that is last year. Well, this current year's budget. Okay. And the town budget. I just I I'm, I was having a hard time trying to find it today. So I'm just wondering if it lives out there in a place where. The budget information that's online at this point is fiscal year 09, which is the year that we're in right now. Yep. The fiscal year that we're in right now. Okay, but, great. But all the backup information, everything that the counselors and the school board members get um, with regard to budget, I think all of it, is public, is public documents. So there's a way to get it. I don't know if every single page is published, you know, every little worksheet is online, but there's a way to get it if you want to. Okay, get cool. it. great, thanks. If you want more information on the school budget, you can contact the superintendent's office and they can either direct you to where you can get it or provide it for you. Good, great. And then my second question of you all is, 
there's definitely some great opportunity in the town here to be able to relook at some ways to increase revenues. And I'm wondering whether or not the council and the board are open to creating another forum for brainstorming opportunity or if it's something that we should just do privately to try to come up with some real creative ways where we're not looking at cutting some municipal services possibly or getting rid of some of the fabulous education that we've got, but getting very creative on how we as a community can spearhead some revenue initiatives. If you want to provide those ideas now, we'd love to hear them. If there's something you want to flesh out more, you can send us an email, send us a letter, give us a call. I think what I'd be looking for really is an arena for people to get like a, a think tank together and really brainstorm some creative ways to, I mean, one of the things to just take another look at is, is generating revenue through Fort Williams. Um, and that's a, a very clear thought. But there are a lot of people out there who've got some great ideas that I think if we could create some kind of a think tank to brainstorm might be a viable option to some alternatives. So I'm wondering whether the town would be willing to create that kind of an arena to get these creative juices flowing. All I can say is if you have ideas, send them in. We're looking for ideas. Great. Okay. Thanks. My name is Helen Mainville and I live at 29 Merrimack Place in Humpstone. I am not here representing the rescue, although I am a member of the rescue. I am here as a taxpayer to voice my opposition to eliminating the local dispatchers. Since last July, our dispatchers have received over 500 calls from citizens in town requesting rescue or fire equipment for some type of emergency. Our rapid response is due in large part because of our four dispatchers who can quickly tone out the alarms, have 20 plus years of experience on average, and know most of the rescue and fire members by name. They know the locations of towns, streets, hydrants, buildings, and work exclusively for Cape citizens and Cape visitors. If our dispatch center is closed, all our 911 calls could well be answered by Cumberland County and Wyndham, Maine. They have five dispatchers, as you've already been told tonight, uh, one of which is completely uh, for the sheriff's office. The remaining four will re be receiving calls from 18 communities in the area. I don't know how that can really be good for the taxpayers of Cape Elizabeth. Apparently the town of Wyndham doesn't think it's a good idea either because they have their own dispatch center. They don't even use them. I understand that we need to cut the fluff out of our town budget, but I do not consider safety of the town residents to be fluff. The town manager estimates that the town can save over $80,000 by eliminating town dispatchers. Maybe we could look somewhere else to save this amount. Maybe community services could be more self-sufficient we spend over $100,000 there. Or maybe the town could get out of the fitness business and we could have community services take over the fitness business. We spend $60,000 there. I don't have a major. It's, it's not me. Sorry. Uh, I didn't do it. I know I didn't bring it tonight for sure. But somehow we need the town needs to, to protect the citizens and make safety a priority. I appreciate the difficult position that the council is in. But I would please ask you to consider the state of concerns before making your final decision and on this issue, and thank you for the opportunity to present these concerns. I do not believe that the taxpayers in this town are even aware of the services that they may be losing. To quote someone else who is concerned with losing our local dispatchers, when you have to stand in line and wait at the town office to conduct business, it's an inconvenience. When you have to wait in line at the transfer station to empty your trash, it's an inconvenience. But when you're having a heart attack and you have to wait for an emergency service, it could be a matter of life and death. Thank you very much. Thank you. My name is Richard Dunham. I'm from 30 Ocean View Road. Uh, I'm here mainly because I'm a parent of a young child in the school system, so that's first and foremost in my mind. And at the same time, I'm here to say that I think in, in today's time and market, we've, uh, we have no choice or would be irresponsible to do anything else than a 0% tax increase. And I think both can be done. Now, that's a huge challenge I'm throwing at you, and thank you very much for your public service, but you've got to lead the way in it. 
especially this year. I love what you're doing today with this collaborative effort, but if you don't have the resolve, so the step one to doing this is we've got to resolve to do it. We've got to resolve to say, yes, we can have a 0% tax increase and we can have great schools. We can't do it through examples as letters to the state talking about subsidies. Yeah, that won't get it done. Debates and votes on transferring funds from one, one uh, section of town money to the other won't get it done. Everything's got to be on the table. Everything from the past, from Fort Williams to Chewankee to anything at all under the sun has got to be on the table as open for respectful dialogue. And thirdly, why I say you've got to really help us with this this year is we've got a lot of, after the last vote, the last election, we've got a lot of uh, advocacy and interest in town. We've got CAPE, we've got CEF, we've got CFA, we've got PCPA, we've got a lot of people involved. I have never met anyone in town that doesn't say we want great schools for our kids. So we've got a common thread there, but we think we're at odds sometimes. So please, from, from your podium, from your vantage point, lead us together in how we can do it all. To take a phrase from the current administration, yes, we can. We can have great schools, and we can do it without a tax increase. So thanks for this collaborative effort and your service. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jenny Smith Brock. I live at 7 Tall Pine Road. I'm the mother of two children in the Cape Schools. I would like to propose an idea that can save the town a great deal of money and greatly increase, increase the percentage of children who become truly proficient readers. There's a method of teaching reading that has the somewhat unfortunate title of synthetic phonics. Phonics is learning the relationship between printed letters and sounds in the spoken language. Synthetic means to blend or synthesize those sounds from left to right as one learns to read words, then sentences, then paragraphs, then books. A particularly inexpensive and effective form of synthetic phonics has been developed by different teachers in England. It has spread by word of mouth from teacher to teacher and school to school. The method has become standard in England as of one year ago. It is used in much of Scotland, again, from, um, in that case, I'd say from county to county. It spread a little bit to Canada and it's just begun to sprout in pockets in the United States. Um, a little bit in Illinois, a little bit in Wisconsin, Iowa, and um, one school so far, I think, in Arizona. I'll get to that in a minute. It has been the subject of serious research, showing that it practically eradicates reading difficulties in even the most impoverished areas. But one may wonder, would it be effective with children like ours here in Cape Elizabeth? How much does it cost? Did the children who come into school with, with very good um, literacy backgrounds get bored? Well, last Friday I spoke with a kindergarten teacher at the Tesseract School, an independent school of primarily upper middle class children in Phoenix. She told me repeatedly in the conversation, we are totally blown away by what our kindergarten children are doing since we started Synthetic Phonics this past September. She had been teaching for 15 years and nothing has come close. By January, all 28 kindergartners are reading and writing. All are reading non-predictable books. They started surpassing the first graders at the school, where they had felt they'd been doing a good job up until now. So the school has quickly implemented synthetic phonics into the first grade curriculum <coughs> just recently. In December, the school called in professors from Arizona State to see the amazing results. And it has only cost the school $350 per classroom. The teacher clarified, however, that they could have done it practically for free with Letters and Sounds, a program which is available online. It's been made free by the English government. And there are other free resources available. Synthetic Phonics teaches the alphabetic code. It's different from um, phonics that most of us know in, in America because it's much faster and it starts synthesizing again the letters within the first two weeks of school. Five to six sounds are introduced per week, along with the skill of blending those sounds. Excuse Word me, reading. Jenny, could you wrap it up just to hear? Yes. Thank Word you. reading, such as sat, pin, tin, sit, nip, begins by the end of the second week of instruction. 
By the end of nine weeks, the students have learned how to read, blend, and write the most common spelling for all 43 sounds in the English language. Boys learn as well as girls. There's been a seven-year longitudinal study, very well done, in Scotland, which showed that boys learned as well as girls and were as motivated to read. This is not the case with other methods of reading. I just saw this in a, in a um, mentioned in passing in a section of a book that just came out. It's on the library. It's called The Trouble with Boys. There's a section in there about synthetic phonics, 2008. The need for remedial help is, has been dramatically reduced in schools which fully implement synthetic phonics. Thus, there's a huge cost savings. It works with all ages, preschool to adult, and in large groups as well as small. It need not be done one to one. Word reading abilities of children initially taught with synthetic phonics. Seven years later, they were found to be three and a half years ahead of their peers in word reading. Jenny, sorry, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to ask you to wrap it up. There's quite a few people. Um, but I, I suspect that maybe the superintendent would like to speak with you about your, some of your ideas. Okay, I'd be happy to, to speak with anybody, any parent, administrator, teacher who's interested. It's very inexpensive. The training is very simple, and it's very fun and multi-sensory for the children. Thank you very much. My name is Robert Barton. I live at 8 Woods Knoll Drive. And I understand that uh, we're in tough times and uh, indeed there's going to need to be a lot of cuts and I'm certainly hoping that somehow uh, the cuts can be done effectively so that we can uh, stay on top of things. One of the cuts though that's been uh, talked about I'm very concerned about and I was glad to see so many people also concerned tonight and that's the cut of the dispatchers. I wanted to just share with you quickly two experiences that we had personally in the recent ice storm, we had a power line that was down right across our Woods Knoll Drive, the road going into the house. And uh, there was three homes in there. And we had amazing uh, help from the dispatch service. They were in touch with Central Maine Power, New England Telephone, when they thought it was a telephone situation, in town with the uh, local fire department, and you know, just all kinds of things. And they just absolutely were amazing. And it was during the time when there wasn't enough people to go around to respond to all the concerns that all the people had. But uh, they really were very effective and the uh, Nova Scotia team, I think, finally uh, pulled in and uh, got the wire taken care of. That was one. Another one that was very interesting is uh, we go uh, south typically in the winter for a little while and two winters ago we left and I did my typical down to the dispatch station to tell them when we're going, when roughly we may be back. And the dispatchers are all so thorough, they, and they asked, you know, well, uh, how can we reach you? And I said, well, there's a phone number at the place we're saying, well, do you have a cell phone, too? And they just grill you and get all of this information. Well, it was very fortunate that they did that, because that year, uh, one of the uh, policemen on patrol, checking the house and going around it, was by the uh, back door, and they heard a an alarm going off. And what had happened was, the boiler, uh, the burner wasn't working, uh, the low temperature alarm was going off and it was going to go into Cunningham security, but they didn't get the signal because we had suspended our cable, roadrunner, and all that stuff with Time Water, which included our digital telephone. And so the alarm was going off, but it couldn't go to Cunningham security and the, and the house was getting cold. Uh, they reached me quickly, uh, I forget which number it was, but they called me. I called a neighbor who checks on the house weekly and uh, they went by and sure enough, the burner wasn't working. And uh, we had mine to freeze up. We had about $6,000 of damage. But if it hadn't been caught by that patrolman and by the dispatcher asking for all the personal information, and just that, it was, it was a terrific thing. And I just think uh, it's going to be very hard to measure uh, the value uh, that's lost if, uh, if we don't have those local dispatchers. They do a terrific job. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Patrick Cotter. I've been on the fire department here in Cape Elizabeth since 1995 at Engine One Company, that's the cookie jar station all the way at the end of Shore Road. And also, I was on the rescue for four and a half years, full disclosure, I'm Peter Cotter's son, I was on the school board. Um, I'm here tonight also for the dispatchers. Uh, we have the very best dispatchers in the state, hands down. Um, I've talked to some people, uh, firefighters also <coughs> talk to each other. Talk to some other firefighters who have county dispatch in their town. Uh, the most common problem that they have is when they call on the radio, the dispatcher comes back and goes, what town are you calling from? That could be a very large problem. I'd also like to point out that 
the vast majority of the towns that are represented by county dispatch are have full-time EMS. That means they have someone sitting at the station either per diem or have full-time paramedics or rescue people. We don't. Uh, today was a very perfect example. We needed a paramedic. Before we, just from the sound of the call, our dispatcher uh, called South Portland because we did not have one in town. Uh, it happened to be for someone at the school that uh, paramedic proved to be overly helpful to that little girl. If we cut dispatch, um, it's really going to impede on the firefighter's safety and the EMS safety. Um, I can guarantee you county dispatch isn't going to keep as good a track of where we are. If I'm coming at 3 o'clock in the morning, going down to Broad Cove, coming all the way down Shore Road, if the dispatcher doesn't hear me eventually go off on the scene, he's going to start calling engine 1 or engine 4, depending on what truck I'm on. If I don't answer, and sometimes you're all alone, he's going to send someone back. God knows, could roll over a truck, whatever. That type of stuff is not going to be done by county dispatch. County dispatchers often get overwhelmed. It was a perfect example with this with these, uh, ice storm. They brought in a lot of extra people. They had wait times on their 911 calls. I implore you to please not cut the dispatch. I understand schools are very, very important. I went through school from K to 12 through in Cape Elizabeth, and I can appreciate that we have a top notch, and I do mean top notch, public education. But I don't think that the public safety for the very small amount of money it's going to really save us in the long run. I'd also like to point out the county dispatch is only giving you a two-year contract. You only know the numbers for two years. There are several. You can figure out what the numbers for this dispatch across the street are going to be two, four, six, ten years from now very easily. You don't know what that's going to be. That number might become back three times larger next time. I'd just like to have you keep that in mind. I'd like to just say save the dispatch. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jessica Sullivan, and I live at 38 Cranbrook Drive. Um, I appreciate, uh, first of all, the hours you're all spending wrangling over all this, and um, it's great that you're all here together. Um, you know, as you all know, we're in a national crisis with finance, financial issues. People are losing jobs. They're losing pay, uh, retirement savings. Um, it's pretty rough. And I would urge you all to do whatever you can to not increase our property taxes. I understand that the town uh, is planning to cut the municipal budget such that there is no tax increase. And I would urge the school board to do the same. We have fine schools. My children attended schools here. But, you know, we've got to look at everything. Everything has to be on the table. And really, you know, excellence in education, academic achievement, don't come from just money. So I would, would leave you with that thought. I'm very much in favor of looking at user fees. I think that Fort, the uh, uh, fees for Fort Williams uh, for non-residents should be something looked at very, uh, very carefully to help offset the revenue shortfalls that we're all facing. I personally um, would like to see the dispatch remain local. I was in a farm accident on Fowler Road a year ago, and they were there in a nanosecond. <laughs> and they were local folks, and it was, it was wonderful because I was rushed to the hospital. And so I really think that the, that sort of public safety issue, the short time in which you know, my needs were met, um, were critical. And again, I, I think Fort Williams needs to be looked at for non-residents use. Thank you very much. Good evening. My name is Will Dennison. I live at 1169 Sawyer Road. I'm a senior at Cape Elizabeth High School. I'd like to talk to you about a few things, a few anecdotal stories about my life in Cape. And I'd also like to give you a suggestion on revenues. I'll begin with revenues. Obviously, the normal solutions for revenues simply aren't going to happen in a recession in the economy. The normal happy idea is that we say, let's encourage commercial businesses. That's not going to happen in this economy. It, there's no way. You can't encourage real estate development. You're not going to encourage businesses to come to town. They can't get money from their banks. But we do have a resource in this town that we should be exploiting. That's Fort Williams. Now, with all credit is due, I got this idea from Mr. Walsh when he came in and visited our, my AP government class. We have tour buses that come in to, to visit our fort 
and their passengers are paying the tour bus company. We have businesses that are making a buck after coming to visit our town. This is a resource that we can easily exploit. I've also been connected with two town service, two services in this town. First, the schools. We all know that the schools are outstanding. I'd like to see them that way. In December, I was granted admission at Davidson College, which is a selective liberal arts college in North Carolina. It's my opinion that I was give, granted that opportunity in large part because I attended Cables of the Schools. I'm also a student rescue member. You heard from my father and family friends earlier. I'm not going to keep belaboring the point that the dispatchers are great, it's a local piece, but if you move the dispatchers to Wyndham, you lose a personal touch. When I hear my father call the rest, call dispatch at the hospital, and the dispatcher answers, answers, go ahead, Brian. Or when my mom calls dispatch and she, he says, go ahead, Marianne. That is something that you are going to lose if you move the dispatchers to Wyndham. Is it really worth the $86,000 to move our dispatchers? I think not. But we all have to balance. But I would encourage the town council and school board to remain prudent through this process. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, my name is Mark Zakowski. I live at 29 Ocean View Road in Mountain View Park and uh, am not a lifelong resident here. I've only lived here for 10 years. At first, I'd like to start by thanking the groups for coming together and most importantly for having a civil discussion. And I'd like hopefully anyone that's listening to remember and hopefully keep in mind that while a lot of us may disagree on where things may need to come out of the budget or where to put cuts, rather than argue uh, against different advocacy groups, I think we should be taking our ire out in the legislature that frankly hasn't done its job for the past 20 years. They've underfunded our town, and they've underfunded our schools, and I think we need to keep that in mind and not argue with each other. I agree with a lot of the comments here made tonight, specifically with keeping the dispatch. I'm in healthcare. I do see the need for local organization and safety for calls. I think it's critical. And I think in a small community like ours with limited access to cell phone reception and a lot of small, unmarked, narrow roads in very intricate neighborhoods that are hard to access, that's critical. I'm also here to advocate for our schools. I moved here for our school system. That's why I didn't live in South Portland. That's why I didn't choose Scarborough or Gorham. They're fine, but I came here so my kids could have a good public education like I did where I grew up. I believe it's our responsibility to fund our schools appropriately. I'm not asking for a gold card or a free pass. I believe our superintendent has done a magnificent job by having an artificial cap placed on his budget for the past several years. I believe our schools have made much tougher sacrifices than the municipal budget, budget has been forced to over the past several years. I would also ask you to all keep in mind that um, many of the, the increases in the school budget are tied to fixed union contracts for our teachers that are appropriate. Our teachers overall are underpaid to begin with. So I think to suggest that the school should have a 0% increase may not really understand the true nature of the contractual business that the unions have with our, with our school system. Finally, I'd also like on the revenue side to agree with those that have said that we need to look at access fees for Fort Williams. I would also like the school board and perhaps the town council to look at working with public-private partnerships in finding pet projects within the school system and within the town. We have a lot of corporate leaders that live in our town and there are a lot of corporate resources that are still untapped. I would love to see more public-private sharing of resources and perhaps sponsorship of different programs that would, have, that would take things out of the budget and lessen everyone's tax burden. I would also like a 0% tax increase. Who wouldn't? But I also want my kids to be able to go to a good school. And I want my property values to stay stable, if not increase, when the economy recovers, which it eventually will. I thank you all for your time, and I very much appreciate your efforts. Thank you. My name is uh, Mark Dorval. I live at Six Farm Hill Road. Um, I have my oldest child who uh, is in kindergarten, utilizes the school system, 
and also the extended care at community services, which provide great services. Um, tonight we've heard a lot about our dispatchers dispatching emergencies. They also help oversee programs. One of the programs they oversee is the Great Starts program, which allows senior citizens living alone and people with disabilities in our community to call in between the hours of 8 a.m. and 10 a.m. If they don't call, the dispatcher calls the house to make sure everything is okay. This past Tuesday, um, the dispatcher didn't get a call. He called the house, got a busy signal, tried again, got another busy signal. He sent the police down to the house, and there was our senior citizen laying on the floor, unable to get to the phone. They were able to get into the house. They were able to have rescue transport. I mean, this is you know, more than dispatching emergency. They, this dispatcher was able to oversee this program. And when I ask, you know, what about if we do go to county, what's going to happen with this program? What's going to happen to this service that we provide the senior citizens in this community, the people in our community living with disabilities? And nobody can give me an answer. I get a shrug of the shoulders. They're not sure. So I think that's important. And I think that if we do go to county or anywhere else, I think the quality of service will suffer. But thank you. Good evening. My name is Greg Altsnauer. I live at 25 Kildeo Road. I can probably say I'm the only one out of this whole room that against Paul, David, Sarah, I lost against the town council. Uh, these guys, I give them a big hand because they've been up here all day listening to everybody. There's a couple points I'd like to bring up that I think is important that I think a lot of people don't know or the public doesn't know. And one is the talk about you know, the dispatchers not being able, the public has no knowledge of this. I think it's about time we, as a town, as people, we join together and figure out how we're going to save the town dispatchers, how we're going to save our schools. Our schools are the reason why I moved here four years ago. Schools are the most important part. Is the reason why the community, the people, and us, we all are one big family. And the second part is not only the schools, but I think one of the things up here on the things, increasing revenues. I'm a member of the Fort Williams Advisory Commission. And probably tomorrow I might not be, but right now I am. And, and I, think, I think you should be aware of some things. Are you aware that there is a, a proposal to demolish Goddard Mansion for $65,000? Does anybody know this? Raise your hand. Okay, there's some people out there. There's, there's, there's issues out there. Battery Blair is going to cost between $771,000 and $1.4 million to repair it. Okay, it's going to go, it's going down, it's falling apart. The bleachers are between $434,000 and, and $732,000. Um, it's just, it, it, it's, it's Goddard Mansion. To repair a whole Goddard Mansion is $650,000. To put a fence up so it won't fall down is $10,000. These are issues that town's looking for. So I'm pouring, I'm really begging the town council here. Increase the revenues. Let's have fees at Fort Williams. Very simple, a dollar a person. It's very simple. The buses that come from Japan, from all these cruise ships, we could get $20 a person, a bus, or whatever. Let's get revenue. We have this very important resource in town that we could use for our schools, to pay for teachers, to pay for dispatchers, and pay for the repairs at Fort Williams. But thank you very much for listening to me. Town Council, thank you. Thank you. Fred Prince to Rocky Hill Road. Two points. One, if you look at the, at the uh, municipal budgetary process, there's something to make your blood boil. What do you do? We need some money, so let's cut out the most popular thing. Why do you do that? You get a room full of people saying they'll pay more taxes to keep that more popular thing. Now, you're all homeowners. If you have two kids, a wife and a husband, and all of a sudden you lose your job, you don't shoot one of the kids <laughs> to make the budget. You cut down on other areas. What areas? I've been here since 1967. We did not have a spring cleanup. We did not have a fall cleanup. We had Joe Valachi. 
A lot of you new people don't know Joe Valachi. He drove a great big truck, and you put it in the back of his truck, and you paid him for his services. This town is out of money. We have a big debate on should we put a sidewalk down Shore Road. You've got to be kidding me. <laughs> it's a very dangerous road. How many people have died? Never heard that number. we are got to put a stoplight out here. Very dangerous. $30,000 a year. That's one person on the uh, people you're trying to save. How many people have had accidents out there? We don't get that number. Come on, you got to think. Now, the point which I have is, on all three of those points, there's another thing which makes my blood boil, both as a businessman and as a taxpayer. The state loves to uh, pass unfunded mandates. And I think it's about time this town got together with other towns and said, that's it. If you don't think it's, enough, it's important enough to have money coming to pay for this mandate, we're not doing it. And you can take your rules, well, you know what I'm going to say. <laughs> Thank you for your time. Good evening. My name is Carl Pearson. I live at 27 Fowler Road. I was told I can't come to speak as a member of the rescue, the fire police, or the wet team, so I'm not. Um, I am a former uh, town councilor, and I've been through one of these, many of these sessions. So I appreciate all you're doing and thank you for your time. Uh, following that, that actually is a good segue into, if you were wondering, I'm going to hit the points. I wasn't going to. I was going to give some analogies about why we should keep dispatch and everything else, and I'll probably get to that. Uh, but increase in revenues. I thought that tonight you could probably charge admission here, sell popcorn and cold drinks. <laughs> and that would have been great, and it's well worth the while. Uh, this is what I typically do. I used to do this on the council, too. I doodle and I write things down. I was going to write it down in an orderly fashion, but I didn't. So here's my key points here. Increasing revenues. There are so many ways to increase revenues in town. Community services, you don't have to do away with it. Introduce a movie night. Kids don't have anything to do in Cape anyways. Have a movie night. Popcorn and everything. Wow, that's some money. Doesn't cost anything. Rent the movie. We'll call it good. Uh, as I said, we can charge admission here. Uh, the dump. We don't have to reduce hours. Let's increase revenues. Universal waste. If you bring up a TV or whatnot, we have the universal waste day. You know you're supposed to dispose of those. They cost you anywhere from $10 to $40, depending on if you go to Scarborough or Riverside. Okay? Those are for profit ventures. They're not doing it for fun. All right? They're making money on that. We could make the same money here. So we could actually increase revenues. We don't have to decrease expenses. Uh, fees. Increase the fees. I'm a commercial business owner as well. I don't mind paying a few extra dollars to take it to the transfer station versus going over Riverside Street. If I charge the homeowner that's hiring me, or Veloci, and I know Joe, because I took over part of his trash room. Um, anyways, so you can call me instead of the town in uh, spring and fall cleanup. Um, but the time it takes me to go to, actually, I'll, I'll go a little aside. Uh, I was accused of being a commercial hauler at the town for doing a trash pickup. My business is called r and with TST, which is rubbish and recycling with transfer station transportation, which I had to change because now it's the recycling center. So it's RCT. Anyways, the town manager called me on it and said I was a commercial hauler. At the time, there was an ordinance that said commercial haulers could not use the transfer station. So for a full year, I went over to RWS. Essentially, all I was doing was providing transportation for taxpayers who couldn't or didn't want to go to the transfer station. I wasn't adding to the trash. I wasn't having a compacting truck. It was all generated cash. I was cutting down on traffic on the road. I was cutting down on emissions. I was actually being green friendly. I went to RWS. It took an extra two hours to do that. If they're shut down, it takes six hours. So these are just, uh-oh, do they have a cell phone? They shut off the page. Anyways, these are just ways to increase revenues instead of reducing expenses. Uh, as I said, I've got a whole list, which I'll email the council on all this. Uh, spending cuts. I might be wrong here. Dispatch is totally off the table. You guys should know that. The analogy I like to use is a couple of them. One is Home Depot. Everyone said, oh, we'll bring in a big box store. Essentially, there's the equivalent of let's put it all in one call center. How many people have been out to Home Depot and enjoyed that more than going to the local hardware store or Rufus Deering? I'm betting it took you longer to get out there, took you several hours by the time of traffic, and you really didn't save a heck of a lot. You got no knowledge. You got no local information. You're going to do the same thing with dispatch. We're going to Wyndham. Everyone's here has already spoken about that. I can tell you people that know where their hidden keys are, and dispatch knows that. Can you imagine the volumes of books that you'd have to take up to Wyndham and say, here, 
These are all the places where the keys are hidden. All right? So we'll go back to increasing revenues by spending cuts. I'm betting that we could turn out another 10 or 12 or two dozen streetlights around town. You'd see a heck of a lot more stars and leave the light on next door. It's not Hotel 6, but it'll be that any day of the week. All right? Leave the light on across the street, not on the streetlights. Uh, last, property tax levels. The only gripe I have there, and this gentleman said we got to tell Augusta, and I brought this up with the town manager and the assessor, Matt Sturgis, will tell you that I drive him nuts. I've still got a pet peeve on this one. I paid essentially what my house is assessed at. Not a problem. I paid that. I gratefully pay those taxes on it, and I was willing to do that. I know another person, several other instances, where they paid $600,000 for a house, and they're being assessed on $240,000. They're in a better financial position than me. That's not equal. There's something wrong there. If you're willing to buy a house at a price, you're willing to pay the taxes on it. You want to equalize that? Now, I know there's a big thing up in Augusta where they have the 80% rule and all this other gobbledygook. Well, where's the funding that comes to that? Uh, Fort Williams, just to hit on that, forget funding the, don't charge admission, concessions. This was brought up before. You have a private vendor come in there, they're responsible for trash, they get a percentage, the town gets a percentage. Our best, best concession is the Fort Williams Museum. Look at the revenues it draws in. That's town owned. All right? We could do the same thing with a private industry concession, charge a fee. You can hit the tour buses, that's fine. Suggest a donation. As far as the rebuilding, which I think Greg brought up, of the uh, guarded mansion, I believe it was probably eight, ten years ago, maybe the town manager knows, there was a history professor that volunteered to come and actually restore guarded mansion at no cost to the town, provided that he could do it over four years as a study. And he would stabilize that mansion and rebuild it at his cost because he thought it was historically significant. No cost to the town. The reason it didn't? Liability. And he was even willing to bound it. So there's a lot of different things here, as I said. I'm going to share these. I'm going to stop with the gobbledygook. I thank you all for your time, and thank you for coming. Thank you, sir. Oh, cell phone. Where is it? Ah, window. Yeah. I'd like to just grab 15 more seconds if I can. It's something that I forgot. No one was behind me. There's no one waiting to There's speak? There's no one waiting. He told me that I, you just told me I should go, right? Yeah, but I didn't say take all night. No, 15 <laughs> seconds. 15 seconds. 15 seconds. My point was just that I forgot to mention, my neighborhood has been coming before the town council in particular for the past year to try and scream as loud as we can that we do not want to bar in Rudy's. That was 2008. And, and this is something I did forget to mention in the beginning. And I can't wait to I get his age when I can do that. And I'm not there yet. But geez, I cannot wait to do that. Because this is how blown away I am by 2008, you're talking about putting in a bar. And now 2009, you're taking away potentially dispatch. What message are you sending to my neighborhood? Do we now have to police ourselves in 2010? I, I don't get where this town council is going with a group of uh, community people in my neighborhood who have been crying very loud about helping us with that, and this is what we're getting. So I just thank you for the extended time. I forgot to mention that before. Thank you. And I would ask that before anybody else speaks twice, we make sure everybody gets their first chance through. So go ahead, please. My name is Harold Pacius. I live at 882 Shore Road, uh, Cape Elizabeth. And I want to make just a couple of general observations that I hope both the school board and the town council uh, will keep in mind. I think they know this. I have heard three people here tonight say, the reason I moved to Cape Elizabeth is the good schools. That's nice. I have uh, been accosted at the dump. And people have said the same thing. You know, you've got to vote uh, uh, for an increase in school budget. Because the reason I moved to town, and many others moved to town, is for the schools. That's very nice. And I'm proud of that. But there are other reasons why people live in this town. I live here because I want to, not because of a particular service. And what I worry about is people who move here just because of the schools leave when they're finished taking part of that service. That's the end of it. And that's the end of the feeling for the town. So there ought to be some balance, and I hope that we'll hear less of it. Uh, I'm here only because of the schools. Because some of us, I'm old. I'm almost 73 years old. 
I don't want to leave town. I've been here my whole life. My perspective is 70 years in this town. 70 years. When I was a kid, when I was in kindergarten and first grade in Cape Elizabeth, there weren't far fewer people, but there were fewer. And I think it was around 5,500 or 6,000. So we've grown by a third since then. Retrospect and anecdotes are pretty good. They're helpful. Picture this when we had five or 6,000 people. We had one part-time policeman in town. It's a fact. Still a great town. Still a relatively safe place. We had, we have a great superintendent here. We had one superintendent and one school administration for Scarborough and Cape Elizabeth. We shared it. We live in an area in Cumberland County where there are 15 towns within 12 miles. If you go out west, it didn't happen that way. We didn't, you know, we didn't have those New England settle style settlements out west. So you had larger boundaries for municipalities. And if we were out west, we'd have 220,000 people in our community. And some of them are pretty good communities. And some of them have neighborhoods like Cape Elizabeth. So uh, I'm all for consolidation, frankly. And I never have understood this fear factor of why people are against consolidation. It's fear. And uh, I, I happen to have been in politics, and uh, I've had it up to here with fear. So uh, a retrospective is important to understand what it was like, and it was a great town. I was six years on the Cape Elizabeth School Board. Rarely did we have a school board meeting when people didn't come by as they should, advocating for something they were interested in. That's what democracy is all about, advocacy. So I applaud all of the people, even the ones that I disagree with, for advocating what they're interested in. But it's your job to sort through this and say, well, they're all for something, but, you know, and they're all against something. Don't cut what I'm interested in. Keep what I like and cut what the other guy likes. So that's what happens in these sessions, and that's what happens uh, in democracy. So I hope that you keep the broad uh, picture in mind. Advocacy is important. The people I hear are advocating for countervailing things. And uh, keep in mind, and I know you will, that we had a great town before most of us were here. It was a great place to live. I'm looking at Jim Rowe. He was brought up in this town. Great place to live, and it was different. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, my name is Brian Hanson. I live at Four Brook Road, and um, I've been here for 15 years, I think. And my son <clears throat> benefited greatly from the education that he received. And um, what I have observed that is of concern to me is, and it goes back to a superintendent or two ago who <clears throat> never bought any property here in town, and, and had his children in the school and then moved out of town and the kids came to Cape Elizabeth for a while. And so we as taxpayers are paying for their schooling when the, probably the highest paid official in the town isn't paying any taxes in the town. And I think what I'd like to segue that to Moving forward, from here forward, I would be opposed to teachers being allowed to, who don't live in town, bring their children to school. I don't think that's fair to the taxpayers. And that's, I think, could be a savings of a certain amount. Thank you very much. Thank you. Dan Fishburne, Salt Spray Lane. 
Um, I, I first wanted to sort of react to a couple of the things that were said. I, I've been kind of struck by some of the comments that imply that the schools are, quote, only for the people who use them, or that, you know, even some of the comments we just heard that somehow the town belongs more to people who've lived here longer than others. I, I think the town and the schools belong to all of us equally. And they're a shared responsibility. Uh, most people who don't have kids in the schools today had kids in the schools in the past. And at that time, the community paid for their kids to go to school. I think we also have a, there's something in the Constitution that says that a, a free public education is an obligation. And, you know, I think we need to remember that we have a community responsibility towards educating our children. This is not a matter of you know, just the parents being responsible for paying for public education. So I, I want to talk about revenues and fees. Um, I found myself on Monday at Staples buying two boxes of pencils and a stapler for my son's teachers because they had put out a wish list saying these were items that they needed that the school was no longer uh, providing for them. So it, it's hard to imagine a situation where we say we have such richly funded schools where we're buying pencils uh, for the classroom. Last year, my son's class, the parents wanted to give the teacher a gift certificate, and the students convinced the parents that what she really needed was a chair, because the chair she sat in was falling apart. So you now have parents buying furniture, pencils, and staplers. I think we really need to think about you know, where we're going when, that, when that's the situation. Also, I think most of you know, and I think we ought to do a study on this, the average parent is spending several hundred dollars a year in fees for sports, for after-school activities, for, th for materials, not to mention hundreds of thousands of dollars a year that are being given by parents in donations to the various organizations that support our schools. So we're getting fairly close, quite frankly, to a constitutional issue where we're no longer funding the schools as a community, but we're asking parents to pay for, for public education. So one thing I would be in favor of is spreading the fees more equally. Let's, let's increase revenues. I absolutely agree with that. But let's have fees that apply to everyone in town, not just to parents. Let's make sure that adult community services programs are fully funded. Let's charge fees for Fort Williams. I think there's all sorts of interesting ideas to brainstorm around revenue that we could get from Fort Williams, even licensing uh, the, the use of Fort Williams and Portland Headlight and advertising. Um, I wouldn't even uh, be opposed to thinking about selling the naming rights to Fort Williams for somebody to use uh, in advertising. We could charge for uh, trash at the transfer station. We certainly for, should charge for heavy item pickup. These are services just like the services parents are being asked to pay for that all citizens uh, could share in. Um, as my final comments would be on spending cuts, what do you do when times are tough? And times certainly are very tough right now, and I don't envy you the responsibility you have. What you do is you preserve the most valuable assets that you have. You don't add new things. Now, certainly not the time for new capital expenditures. It would be great to have a bike path, new intersection, all sorts of things, but now's not the time to do that. What you do is you hunker down and you protect what you have. So you look at what are your most valuable assets public safety, the parks that we have certainly are a huge asset, and our high quality schools. We should maintain the services they have. We certainly shouldn't add new things at this time, but we should absolutely provide a budget that enables the schools to continue to provide what they're providing today. Thank you. Uh, good evening, my name is uh, Tom Kinley and I live at 1159 Shore Road. And I uh, thought I'd just take a few minutes to uh, kind of echo uh, some of the comments that have been already been made. Uh, but first, I want to just say that uh, I can appreciate the city manager's position because I run a corporation. And we've had layoffs, and we've had to cut back. And we didn't have any choice. We didn't have the ability to raise taxes uh, without, uh, uh, the, uh, with, without people being able to say, hey, I'm not going to pay that because we run, a, corp we run a, a corporation that depends on people paying their bills, and if I raise them too high, uh, then I, they're not going to pay me. And it ought to be the same way with taxes. In an economy that we're in today, people are cutting back. And I appreciate the dispatchers. I run a dispatch center, and we happen to dispatch for three states. 
Uh, it's not an emergency dispatch center uh, like uh, um, uh, ambulance and fire, but we run a dispatch center. And I used to run a little one in Vermont, and I thought, there's no way they can do that in Maine. Well, you know what? We did it in Maine. Uh, and so it is possible. Uh, one thing I would tell you, though, if you're going to go with a centralized dispatch center, you better get a contract that talks about the quality of the services that they're going to give you uh, and make sure that there are uh, checkpoints within that contract so that if some of the things that have been mentioned here tonight occur, there are consequences to those things occurring. And, of course, the best consequences for anything occurring is that you don't pay them for bad service. Uh, and so there are ways around it. Do, do I think it's better to have dispatchers here in town? Of course. Uh, do I think the economy can support everything we do in this town today? I don't think so. You know, uh, we are, uh, our excise tax are down because people who live in this town can't afford to buy the new car they would have bought this year. Well, that tells you that not everybody lives in $600,000 homes and are continuing to have the same income coming in and having the freedom to spend as they always have spent. And the town and the schools shouldn't have that same freedom. I think you need to think about how you can reinvent what you do and making sure that the quality of the schools and the town services stay within certain ranges. And, and unfortunately, it's up to you people to decide that because that's the job that you got elected to. But I, I believe in an economy that we're in today, and you're going to be right back here in 2011 because the economy is not going to get any better in 2009. So come uh, early uh, next year, you're going to be right back here talking about the same things. And so you need to think about uh, how you can do things differently. We've had to do it in our organization where we laid off 12 people, and there wasn't one easy one of those to give the notice to. Um, and so everybody's making tough decisions, and the economy's not going to get any better. And we should have a 0% increase across the board. And we need to figure out how to do that. I wish there was a silver bullet where you could build three or four uh, 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 places out here that you could add to the tax rolls, but unfortunately that's not possible. And not in the time frame that you have. I, I can't believe that I would be up here tonight talking about raising and putting fees on Cape Elizabeth because I or on uh, uh, the, the uh, Fort Williams because I've always been opposed to that. I always felt that was something as a uh, person who did not take advantage of the school that I got. But I think when, when you get into these kinds of situations where you need to raise revenues, and I don't know how much that would even raise, to be honest with you, it might cost you more to administer than it would to raise money, but I think it's worth looking at. I think uh, doing something at the recycling center, and uh, a month ago, I was here when uh, Mike uh, briefed uh, the council on uh, some of the ways we could raise money and cut down on spending money at the uh, recycling center. I was opposed to Again, I felt it was something that I got from my tax pay, from my taxes already uh, as a non-school user. But when you're in a situation where uh, we need to raise revenues, maybe those are some areas that we ought to look at. Uh, I do find it interesting that we uh, use more tonnage uh, in the uh, Echo, Maine than any town our size, which is kind of, uh, of interesting, and maybe we do need to do something uh, about that. So uh, again, uh, I don't have any silver bullets on the increase in revenues. I think you do need to cut spending. I, I'm not an expert at the school, so I don't know where you should look, but I think you do need to look at how you can cut spending. I think you need to stop developing new ways of spending money by building new things. I happen to be opposed to the bike path, as uh, our city manager knows. But we constantly build things that need to be plowed, need to be maintained, need to be taken care of, and we continue to increase our ongoing expenses, which then raises our taxes. So even if somebody gives you something for free, uh, ask the uh, Southern Maine University and all the buildings that they've built down there that they no longer can afford to heat, and oh, by the way, they didn't get all the people into them that they thought they were going to, and now the taxpayers need to pay for those. You have the same problem in a small town when you start building paths and sidewalks that need to be plowed, need to be salted, and need to be maintained. 
and I think you ought to really take a hard look at your comprehensive plan, because if you do everything in your comprehensive plan, you better be looking at doubling your tax rate to cover it. So I appreciate the opportunity to be here tonight, and uh, I thank you for your service. Thank you. Hi, I'm Betsy Dawkins. I live at uh, 202 Two Lights Road. And um, I have two connections with the school system. Um, I go in there as a rescue member, and I depend on the dispatchers to tell me which door to go in. If you think about the schools and how many doors there are, it's kind of nice to go into the door that's closest to the kid, and um, the dispatchers know that. Um, I also want to let you know, and I don't think it's been said here, I don't know if many of you know that um, the rescue is on call. None of us are sitting around the, the fire station uh, waiting, waiting to be called out. We're in our homes, we're in the gardens, we're in the basement, we're doing whatever, and we're called out, and if we can go, then we go. Um, and we, we really depend on the dispatchers to let us know how to get where we're going, because I don't know every street in Cape Elizabeth. Um, and it's so helpful to have them uh, give us more specifics on where to go. And they also check on you. One time I was going to a rescue call on a snowy, icy evening, and I said I was 10-8 to the, the scene, and I slid off the road and landed in a tree, and uh, the dispatcher came back and said, uh, you know, Portable 16, where are you? Because <laughs> I didn't say I was 10-8 to, uh, to the patients, and, uh, and I said I was... Uh, under a tree, <laughs> and uh, and they, I'm not going to get that if it's sent out to uh, uh, Wyndham. Um, and I, I've always thought of Cape Elizabeth as a small town. I think I've heard that name used several times here. And if we do things like send out our dispatchers, that is, well, does anybody know the percentage of the cost of the dispatchers to the entire budget? It's less than one percent. It's it's minuscule compared to the schools, everything else. And, it, and it's one of the more valuable things that we have. Um, be, because we don't um, have people waiting at the station, we, we have special needs for our health care in Cape Elizabeth, and I think that's why it should be considered. And the other thing is, one other thing is, um, it, it, speaking of ways of saving money, my other connection with the school is in my house, when I, when I don't go to, to work during the week one day because I uh, work on weekends, there is a school bus that goes by my house, a different one, three times in a half an hour. And I'm like, there goes another 50 bucks. It just seems like if that's the way the schools are trying to cut their budget, I think maybe they need to look at a few more things. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Hi, I'm Laurel Grass and Drake from 9 Wainwright Drive. Um, I guess the first thing I'd just like to say is I'd like to say I'd appreciate the tenor of the discourse tonight. There have been a lot of times in this town over recent years where it's felt like um, if you have something to say that's different from what somebody else believes, that it's very you're very quick to be put down. Um, in fact, there have been times where I felt very uncomfortable about publicly speaking about my viewpoint because there were such strong voices voicing a different side. And so I do appreciate that everybody who's been speaking here has, has been, it, it hasn't been that kind of discourse. Um, I, I am concerned we don't have bottomless pockets. Um, and I would put my voice in for keeping taxes flat. Um, I think that there are a lot of things we want. We can't get them all. We can't afford them all. Um, there comes a point where we've got to draw some lines. And, and I appreciate the issues there. And I realize that the heaviest part of this is, by definition, going to fall on schools because that is the bulk of our budget. Um, 
I do teach at Chevres, by the way, and at Chevres we're also having to get some of our own pencils. We go to Ruth's to pick up free supplies, and we've just been told we won't be having blue books for this testing period. We will have blank sheets of paper instead because the blue books have gone up four times in price. So that's to say that that kind of cost cutting is happening in the private sector as well, not just the public sector, that everybody is facing it. Do I think that's an ideal situation as a teacher? Is that what I want? No, it's not. But it, it is just to say that is the environment we're in. Um, one of the concerns I have is that when we talk about education here, it seems like it's always a discussion of more money equals better education, and the only way to better education is more money. And if you argue any other point, then what the accusation is, you're against children, you're against education. And I think there are a lot of other things to be looked at. We don't talk about, I, I haven't heard what really any solid goals things we want to achieve, where we're going, what is it we're funding? What do we want to get from that funding? You know, in increasing the funding, have we seen better results? What are the results we're measuring? I also come from a business background, and it feels like everything is very fuzzy. There's nothing solid. It's just, let's throw more money in, and we must get something better. But that's not necessarily the way it works. And it feels like we need to get a little bit more serious about looking at goals and results and what we need to do to get that, whether it's money or something else. Um, do we need to look at a change in structure? Should we be looking at what other school systems do? In particular, other school systems who face big cuts, how do they handle it? Have we talked to them? Have we looked at what kinds of solutions they came up with? The person who was just here talking about the fact that if you do outsource dispatch, you should get a contract that has this, this, and this on it because he knows dispatch. We've got a lot of professional people in Cape Elizabeth with a lot of expertise in a lot of ways. And it's not being tapped. I mean, there, if, if you do, and I'm not saying it's the right answer, but if you do have this dispatch contract, you know, can you get some advice from somebody who knows this? Energy. We've got people who have amazing energy experience. Use it. Um, management, structure, all sorts of things. And, and in fact, when, you know, hearsay, but what I've picked up is it seems like sometimes when people do offer to do that, they're put off, you know, they're kind of pushed away because the idea is we're stepping on somebody's territory. And, and I think there needs to be more of a sense of us all working together to try to achieve the same goals in a difficult environment and sort of welcoming people into that process, which you're doing tonight, and I appreciate that, rather than necessarily trying to um, maintain a, a, a safe territory, feeling threatened by people. Um, Could you wrap it up, please? That's all I wanted to say. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm Jana Zimmerman. I live at 81 Oakhurst Road. I have two children in the schools. And um, I didn't bring textbooks tonight. That's my usual thing for the last three years now to bring my stack of textbooks that date back to 1983. Um, I would just like to encourage, a lot of people use the words excellent school district. They use the words that they've gotten an excellent education. So when you're thinking about the budget, I would like you to think about it realistically. We have outdated textbooks. We have furniture that's in disrepair. We have a system that is not excellent. I have a kindergartner now that we added last year. He's, in, in my opinion, an overcrowded kindergarten class that is not a full-time kindergarten class, as in most communities. So we're starting out at a deficit. Um, I just bought a box of paper for my sixth grade child's class because the way they supplement not having you know, intact, full curriculum materials is Xerox. Well, they're running out of paper. 
Um, this is an online world now, and we need to be online with our textbooks. We need um, to be up with the contemporary way that education, the trend that it's going. We are right now in a bottle shed, every, you know, several um, every day with volunteers from the middle school in order to buy textbooks. I moved here for schools. I never dreamed I would be on the coldest day in a bottle shed trying to get enough money to buy books for my child's school. And I'll leave you with that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, first of all, thank you for your service. Um, Francis Haywood, 1221 Shore Road. I have a couple of things to say. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, express my very strong agreement with um, one of our true town treasures, Mr. Fred Prince. I think he was absolutely right to um, speak about cutting something that's, you know, an obvious um, asset to many, many people in the town as, as kind of the first blush. Um, I think our dispatch service should definitely remain local. I think it's a, a major safety issue, and I think it's one of those things that there was a gentleman earlier, I was at home watching on the television, who spoke about one of the reasons, you know, he sleeps well at night because he just knows that help is really a telephone call away and, and just a very few minutes away. And I really, really agree with that, and I hope um, that that will not be sent to some uh, hinterland of the mega telephone call center. Um, the second thing is about the school budget. I remember last spring when there was um, some gnashing of teeth about getting the school budget passed on the second or maybe it was even the third vote. Um, I ran across one of the teachers from the middle, middle school, a teacher who I know to be an absolutely wonderful teacher and a real team player as well. Um, and I was saying, you know, I don't know, is there waste? Is there too much administration? Is there, you know, where is the money that people think should be saved? And one of the suggestions she made, and I talked at the, at the time to several of the school board members, if not all of them, many of them, and relayed this lady's suggestion that there be a, a suggestion box put in each school for the teachers to put in anonymous suggestions as to where money could be saved. And, and with the expectation that would be sincerely and, and you know, thoughtfully welcomed by the administration and particularly by the school board. Um, does anybody know if that was done? It seemed like a very reasonable suggestion to me. It's being done. I think we have a great staff of teaching of teachers in each of our schools, and I certainly hope that their input is really actively sought and listened to in terms of um, cutting expenses and positions that are um, meant to be very useful and productive within the school, but then turn out for whatever reason not to be. And I think that the teachers work with that every day, and I think they know it. And um, I think that that's, the school is a huge expense center for the town, and I think everybody takes great pride in our school system, and I, and I would like to see it well funded, but I think that we can look at everything and make sure the money that we're putting into something, it gives us that amount of dollars in return. And then the only other quick comment is that I think the community services programs should be really totally self-sufficient. We have, we run a quite extensive uh, daycare or after school care or maybe daytime care as well. And I think that that should really be completely funded, including, you know, share of heat and light and 
building taxes and cost and et cetera by the people who use it. I think that's just a, that's not an obligation of all the citizens of the town to do daycare for some of the citizens of the town. So anyway, thank you. Thank you very much. Others? My name is Chris Bolsa O'Meara. I live at 73 Two Lights Road. Um, and I thank you for your time this evening and for everyone's comments. Um, as you are working together to solve this major crisis that we have in these budgetary times, um, I want you to remember that it's, it all works together. I mean, if you think about um, cutting community services, um, what that means is that um, anybody who plays any sport in Cape Elizabeth pretty much will have to do that through community services because right now the school is not paying, um, is not funding coaches, is not funding sports at any level. Um, you might think, well, that's okay. The people who do sports should pay for the sports. But what happens to those families who then can't afford that? What are those kids doing after school to um, enrich themselves? What's going to happen to them? And what are they going to do inside our community that might cause um, our need for police to rise or our need for firemen to rise? Um, there are many more communities out there that are not as fortunate as we are who are still funding their school sports programs. Um, in ways that we are not. Um, and I think that the marginal support that we are providing to community services is important. Um, again, take a look at the need for a library. Yes, you can drive by several libraries pretty much on any given day. Um, have you been to a library, the public library after school and seen how many students who are there utilizing a supervised area to do homework, to do research, to get help with homework after school? Um, those are things that um, will be, you know, out of, out of their hands, what will happen to those students after school. Um, it, everything has a trickle-down effect, um, and I think it's really hard and it's a difficult place that we're in to try to be thinking about cutting services when you're just looking at the numbers. Um, so keep in mind of what happens when you do that. If you close that library three afternoons a week, what happens to all the people who go there? Um, is it maybe a place where senior citizens go because they can cut down on their feet for three hours and they can go to the library and read periodicals and visit with friends um, and save a little energy at home? Um, it's part of what makes the community a community. Um, so I, I really felt I needed to say that about community services, and thank you for your time. Thank you. Next. Good evening, Kevin Sweeney, 7 Phillip Road, which is the purpose of the audience, a 10 plus year retired school board member. Um, one editorial comment, then I'll go directly to your questions. I am the epitome of the fixed income individual, too broken to work, too young to use my retirement savings. Um, yet my sacred cow is still the schools. That said, increasing revenues, because I haven't heard too many responses to the questions over there. Increasing revenues, I have to agree and reiterate what's already been said. It's time to take a serious look at Fort Williams. It is definitely time for community service, as has been stated, to be 100% self-sufficient. We do need to look at fees at the transfer station. But the, tr the fees, I don't believe, should apply to normal household trash, rather an increase in fees for large items, such as uh, televisions, refrigerators, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, those items that have uh, toxic components such as refrigerators, such as um, air conditioners, should have an even higher fee. Um, I, I think that covers some of my initial thoughts on increasing revenues. Spending cuts. Um, 
everyone I see up there is either a former colleague or someone I respect. And I know you all apply your critical thinking skills. But I think we really have to look at across the board, not just the schools, not just the town, across the board, at looking at, is this a need or is this a want? I often question that um, when I was serving the community. Particularly in a time of economic crisis like this, we really do need to apply our critical thinking skills to the want versus need. The same thing applies to some of the things I heard about Fort Williams. I don't know if that's entirely accurate or not. I'll just presume that the information previously presented was accurate. These are things we cannot do in the current economic climate. I'm not suggesting that they not be done, but I think we need to look, take a serious look at, again, using the, the need versus want. Do we really need to do this now? In some cases, the answer will be yes, but I think in other cases, many cases, the answer will be no. The next thing I think we need to do is a hiring freeze. Because I, 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 I just bridle at the idea of cutting people's salaries, um, the idea of renegotiating contracts. We've already made a commitment to these people and social justice demands that we keep it. But that doesn't mean we have to add new positions. And when I'm talking about a hiring freeze, I'm talking about new positions. If anybody thinks we should be hiring someone over and beyond our current staffing levels, I think you better take another look at it. I'm not talking about if a teacher retires or a uh, town employee retires, not replacing them. That doesn't fall within the definition of hiring freeze that I'm talking about right now. Property tax levels, it's, I was stunned at the board's majority vote, although I know it was a split vote, to shoot at no more than a 2% target. Um, I think that's not unreasonable to shoot for that target. Whether or not it can be done is another question entirely. But as I said, on an editorial basis, schools are my sacred cow. I don't think we can afford to be spending wild amounts of money. You all know that I bridled at the 13.5%, whether it was real or not last year. But when the thing came down to 6%, I was back on your side, even though it far exceeded my Social Security increase. So that's, that's all I can recommend at this point. What I need to really see, um, and it's probably just a function of having done what you're doing right now for 10 years, is to see some more details. So I looked to see at Alan's um, proposed budget and see what we're talking about right there. One other thing I would like to point out in terms of critical thinking is a couple of years ago when I was still on the board, we were offered a gift from an organization in town. Fortunately, one of the board members took a critical look at that, and it turned out that what we definitely had to have, we didn't need. So um, I'll, end, I'll end on that note. Um, I don't envy any of you. I'm glad I'm retired. Thank, thank you, Kevin. Peter Carter, 21 Ocean House Road, Cape Elizabeth. I will not speak on school department issues. I'd like to address two issues involving public safety. One, earlier tonight, our police department detective spoke to you, and I'm sure there were some people in the audience that said, why in hell do we need a detective in a town like Cape Elizabeth? I'd like to explain why from personal experience. Four years ago, a crime was committed against my business and my family. Access was gained to my checking account. I lost a substantial number of thousands of dollars. Mr. Fenton investigated these 
One week, we had an arrest made. He had to go into South Portland to make the arrest. The investigation was so complete, the bank felt they were co-conspirers in the theft, and we paid me all my money. So, yes, we do need a detective. In regards to public dispatch, I'd like to tell you what would happen if we closed it. I've been a frequent flyer with the rescue, twice as a trauma patient. I may not be able to tell this story, so I'll tell it quickly. I can't control my emotions because of my stroke, so just be patient, please. Whenever I called for the rescue, within five minutes, I had eight people in my bedroom. And I knew them all. They were all friends, neighbors. About a year ago, my son came to our house to paint our roof, fell off the roof. Broke his hip in multiple places. I believe it was like 12 or 14 places. Screaming at the top of his lungs. I heard him fall. At that time, we were part of the 911 enhanced system where all of our 911 calls went to South Portland. My wife used a portable phone outside to call South Portland. They asked her who the victim was, what her address was, even though they had it on phone ID, how old he was, how was he injured, how many feet did he fall, and where was our location. My son was screaming so loud that somebody driving by the house called 911 and called it an automobile accident. I knew better. I called the non-emergency number of Cape and asked for a rescue, and they sent one. I went outside, my wife was screaming, using language I've never heard her use, to dispatch in South Pole, asking for a rescue. She finally got so mad, she just held the phone close to him so they could hear her screams. That's what's gonna happen if you close it this <laughs> back. Excuse me. Is there somebody else who would like to speak? Hi, my name is Ed Hunt. I've been a resident of Fowler Road for 30 years. Uh, I've been a public safety dispatcher for the town for the past 35 years. Uh, I sent a lengthy email to you folks, and I've got a couple things I want to add. Uh, we did speak with some, some officers from Gorham and Cumberland PD, and uh, uh, County Dispatch. They service those two towns, and uh, and so we asked them uh, for the positives and the negatives, and there were no positives. The other thing that I would like to add, like now, right right now, is that I, I have spoken with my three coworkers, and we would be more than happy to sit down and uh, and take a look at the contract and see what we can cut pay and or benefits. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Next. My name is Mary Ann Dennison. My husband and son have spoken tonight, so I kind of waited till last. Uh, sorry, I was just with Mr. Carter. Um, revenue, Fort Williams, spending cuts, community services, um, fitness center. Property tax levels, good luck. Um, <laughs> Can we put a dollar amount on a life? Right now it's $86,000. As the commercial says, I think it's priceless. Thank you. Thank you. Others? Hi, um, I'm Suzanne McGinn, 1180 Shore Road. I just wanted to talk about uh, revenues. Uh, Fort Williams is uh, unfortunately something we have to think about, and I would propose that we start taxing some sort of surcharge for the buses. And if there was some way to have that also for um, two lights, I'm not sure if that's possible but those buses come to both locations, and is there some way to maximize on that? Um, in terms of spending cuts, a, a creative way of potentially thinking about future spending that we may not have to spend on is um, development. We have a potential uh, development that occurs, and the cost of development um, adds to our municipal services in terms of schools, in terms of our um, 
plowing, uh, caring for our roads. If you look at the study that was done by the town a few years back, what were the two most important things to our community? One was schools and one was open space. And it's actually more expensive for our town to develop open space. If you look at studies like in Scarborough, that was, um, I think, every additional household cost our, their town an additional $1,800 in expenses. So it's more expensive to continue to develop our town than it is if we uh, kept it a little greener, as the community has said in their study. Um, other spending cuts? I don't have any at this time. Property tax levels? I would not be opposed to a slight increase in our taxes to help support our schools. I would like to see, um, uh, I think our teachers who are in the trenches would have the best ideas for saving monies within our school. I think an anonymous way for them to bring those ideas forward where um, there would be no perceived punishment if they did that would help uh, generate some new ideas that are outside, thinking outside the box for us. Uh, we have a lot of smart teachers and I know they've got good ideas. Uh, maybe we need to work from the bottom up in terms of uh, curbing spending. One thing I don't want to see cut is the Achievement Center at the high school. I have kids in all three school systems. Um, the Achievement Center is by far the most valuable uh, component, I think, of all three of our schools. It reaches the broadest audience of kids, kids that really need help going forward beyond high school. So that's it. Thank you for your time. I'm very uh, happy to see that the school board is working together with the town council. Thank you. More people? Uh, Bill Descent, 11 Wainwright Drive. Um, <clears throat> I wasn't going to speak, but I think the uh, last speaker, uh, I agree with what she said when it comes to uh, finding fresh thinking, because I think all of us tend to uh, think in a traditional way and some, uh, ignore some of the people who are working under us, where if they could submit their ideas on an anonymous basis, I think something would come from that that would be helpful for everybody. Um, I'm uh, looking at the world that you're living in and we're all um, suffering a lot. Uh, uh, everybody's losing jobs or corporations are cutting. And now, not one or two or three percent, but in 25 and 50 percent. and. Um, I can't think of an entity that's asking for an increase. Um, so I think that as much as I favor good schools, as all of us do, we just have different pathways to this end objective and efficiencies can always be improved upon if we have open minds and collaborative efforts. And to that end, I think that <clears throat> If the public can understand better and there's more transparency to this process as you go forward, line by line kind of a thing, it would resolve a lot of the tension. Um, I also think planning three years ahead as opposed to one year at a time, even though it's difficult, it, it's a guide. And I think had we done that Back in 85, when all the tea leaves from the state said we're going to be losing enrollments throughout the state, um, it might have given us some pathway to stop some programs or perhaps not to invest as much in them. <clears throat> um, I would like, on the third point, obviously, to see no raise in my taxes. And I think that's very achievable when we're talking about holding firm for 12 months. And let's see what shakes out, because I think you've heard it said many times by people in the finance community, we're not at the bottom. This is not uh, going to be a pretty or short painful process. Um, the number one point, 
I think people have hit it right on the head, and I think you all can, I don't have to repeat it, Fort Williams would resolve an awful lot of these problems. But I think we need to go through the process of flushing out the inefficiencies here, if there are any. And I can't help but believe there are. We just have to be open and work on this together. Thank you. Thank you. One, one last point, since I hope I haven't used it. Um, I do think that there should be some accountability or some form of um, something put out there which, so the people can better understand what you need it for. Um, I mean, the, really, the onus should be on the town as well as the school. Set your target, why? And you just can't pick numbers from the air. I think uh, that would be very helpful for the process if you could provide what you want to achieve, what your goals are, and then some measure a year later, did we or didn't we meet them? And what can we do to correct it? Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else who would like to speak? One last thing. Sorry. This isn't my thought. I read it somewhere, and I was sitting here listening to everyone thinking we've got to say this. Beach to Beacon. I've read it somewhere that we were saying that at, for that one week, we're a captive audience. We have almost 30,000 people. I don't think that's a lie, but we have a, a lot of people here. And again, they're using the fort. They're in town. I think we talking about people saying think tanks or what we're going to take from here tonight. That would be one thing to start planning. Beach to Beacon, the, the town coming together and making something where we can make money for this. Mm. And, and if you wouldn't mind stating your name again, please. Oh, sorry. Uh, Laura Lee Shadell. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone else who would like to speak? <coughs> Now's your chance. Okay. I want to thank everybody who spoke. There are a lot of um, good ideas on revenues, on spending cuts, on property tax levels that you'd like to see. Um, I know that everyone on both these boards is committed, committed to working together uh, to try to meet the challenges that we're going to be facing on both the municipal and school budgets. Uh, just to let you know what's coming up, I'd, I'd re repeat that we are having a joint workshop a week from now at the high school cafeteria, but that is not a public forum. It is a public meeting, but it is a work session of the um, two boards, so the public is welcome to come, but there won't be this sort of public participation at that meeting. And then, um, as Kathy outlined and as I outlined, uh, we will proceed onward with our uh, budget processes on the school side and the municipal side. We are open to hearing from you and from those of you who might be watching on television who couldn't come tonight. Send us an email. We've, we've gotten plenty already, but send us more emails, letters. I'm sure we all are happy to get phone calls. And um, we want to hear from you because your priorities will drive uh, our decision making as, as, much as, as much as is possible. Kathy, do you want to add? I just want to thank everybody for coming out tonight and um, appreciate all the information. As I think somebody said, you hear some competing um, um, ideas um, and we are really committed as joint board to try to work together um, and come up with some things that we can do uh, when we when we finally make decisions um, it will go to the voters so if you use this as your last chance to talk with us please feel free to vote when it comes down to it because the school budget will go to the voters again this year so um, anyway uh, appreciate your participation hope you continue to do so if you have questions and you think that they haven't been answered please contact us because I know as one board member I heard a lot of suggestions and so forth and things that may have already been addressed but since we used this as a listening um, period we did not address some of those things but we can at another time or individually if you're comfortable with one person or another um, but we are still looking for uh, information and ideas. So thank you very much. Have a good evening.